Welcome to The Real Deal, where it's all about real estate and related businesses in central Massachusetts and northeastern Connecticut. And now, your host, Anthony Shabbat of Shabbat & Associates. Hey everybody and welcome to The Real Deal Real Estate Podcast. My name is Anthony Shabbat of Shabbat & Associates Real Estate Group of EXP. Attorney Yona Gregory of the Law Office of Yona Gregory. Jay Lorette of Lorette Investment Group. And on today's show, I'm so excited that we have Yona Gregory on the show because I met her at a real estate um, meetup for the Eastern Connecticut Association of Realtors and she gave us a great speech at the Sheridan Hotel in Norwich, I think it was about two years ago, maybe even two and a half, three years ago, I can't remember. But she did such a good job up on stage and I said, we have to have her on the podcast because back then it was just an audio podcast, and I always wanted to do. Oops, I always wanted to do this video podcast, and now that we have the video podcast, I'm looking for people that are going to do a good job uh, on camera. Oh, so the pressure! <laughs> I said uh, she'd be a good match for it. So um, happy to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. And I want you to let me just fix this little thing here a little yep. bit. And then, so I want you to give us a little bit of a background of uh, how you know where did you grow up? Like where did you go to school you know oh. and after and where did you get started in your career and what got you into your career okay so I am I went to school at Connecticut College which is um, where I'm from is New London oh yeah so I'm from New London went to Connecticut College then went to do a bunch of real estate stuff like flipped a bunch of houses and I opened up a restaurant and all of this other stuff in between and then I decided to go back to law school so I took like five years off and then I did all this business stuff and then I went back to law school oh, and great. I went to UConn in um, in Hartford so I went to UConn law and then I came out and I still continue to do my investment stuff and all of that so I have now about 29 units that I hold and manage myself great um, many of them are Airbnbs but I represent landlords because it was just kind of like in keeping with what Perfect. what I do and I wanted to have a vested interest in it mm -hmm. so I don't represent tenants ever in my practice I only represent landlords Great. but I do you know other things besides evictions but evictions now is like the biggest thing in our practice mostly answering questions for free but <laughs> but it's it, it is a big portion of our practice because we're statewide so you must have been busy over the last year and a half yes and a lot of questions right and there's good busy and bad busy and a lot of it was bad busy unfortunately mm -hmm. because you're you know I'm here I've been doing this for 16 years so I have so many um, clients who are you know property managers and they're looking to me for advice and I'm not going to turn them away during a time like this so mm -hmm. you know we have all these people calling and you want to explain to them why there's you know no um, rent for a year and I've explained the Constitution like more times this past year to people regular investors are like I don't understand don't I have property rights so you end up actually giving people like a mini constitutional uh, you know speech um, just to try to give them the background of why this happened, how it happened, kind mm. of a thing. So that was a lot of my last year. But that said, we're still been busy processing evictions all along because even when the court was closed, we were still filing them all along. So we've never stopped processing evictions, but we've just been doing them for different reasons throughout the time frame. Now, of course, we're processing a ton of them. So um, I actually, I, I did interview and we talked about this, another attorney and it was on the subject of evictions primarily because of the um, moratorium on evictions and the effect that it's having uh, for landlords. Mm -hmm. So one question that I didn't ask him, uh, which I kind of kicked myself for, was how long does it take to have it, and I probably change this over the different, mm -hmm. when the laws change, right? Mm -hmm. so, so now how long right now, if somebody were to have uh, to do an eviction with mm -hmm. you, you know, have you, help them with an eviction, how long would it take to complete that? Even during non-COVID times, we never give anyone a definite time. Mm -hmm. I always say to people, it's an average of three months. It could be longer, it could be shorter. There's too many variables in evictions in Connecticut. So there's the variables of each and every court, each judge is different, what the people are gonna do, whether they're gonna default. So, I mean, you could get someone out in three weeks, but you could also take a year and a half because a lot of the people that were waiting from last year were over a year. So I never give definite time frames. Mm -hmm. There's so many differences, and that's one of the difficulties in practicing eviction law in Connecticut is that each court is so different. So you could have a judge that likes this one thing one way and another way. So different courses, 
courts process them differently. So it depends on where you are, what judge there is, what the tenant does, whether they get legal aid involved. You'd have to have like a one of those um, you know things to figure out what goes on in the future to say how long it's going to take in Connecticut. Minority Report. <laughs> So yeah, Tom Cruise. So yes. one of the one of the questions I asked him, um, and you being an investor, uh, we may get a different answer from you. But um, you, you hear a lot from investors of uh, if they have tenants and they took over, take over the building they buy. Um, what is your um, thoughts and? feelings on like cash for keys as, mm -hmm. as far as an investor. If you can get cash for keys um, now, you know, if it's a realistic amount of money, I always encourage cash for, cash for keys. Um, it doesn't get me any business, but truthfully, it usually would be better for the, um, you know, for the, for the landlord or the investor. It just depends. A lot of, 90% of the people will not take cash for keys. You would think to yourself, wow, I know I'm gonna be you know, put out of here anyway. Would it make more sense to take the $3,000 this person's offering me? But unbelievably, and a lot of what eviction law is and a practice of eviction law is counterintuitive to what you think people are gonna do. Just like banks, you know, a lot of short sales is counterintuitive to what you think a business would do in smart business. So tenants don't always behave in a way that you think that would make more sense. So Absolutely. very rarely will they take cash for keys. And a lot of the clients too, they're cheap out on cash for keys. So I'll say to them, definitely do cash for keys. And they're like, I don't understand. A person wouldn't take $1,000. I'm like, well, who would? If they know they're gonna live there for six months for free, why would they take $1,000? And where are they gonna even get an apartment for $1,000? So when you put the cash for keys together, you have to realize it's gonna be a lot of money. It might be hard for you to, for the landlord to see, oh wow, I'm gonna pay this person $3,000. That hurts. but. The alternate hurts too of waiting, you know, all the time for the court to, to come through. So either way, it's it's difficult. I know. I tell clients, you know, uh, if we're looking at multis with with um, tenants in them, I always put aside, tell them to put aside the money mm -hmm. for yeah. it. You know, mm -hmm. just to to schedule for it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have to use it, then you know, it's a hidden bonus. Right, and and that that's what I say to people too. When people call and they're like, "Look, I just bought this building. So many new investors." You know, they they didn't budget for the fact that there's three units in there, and that's going to be you know six months of non-payment for one of them or two of them or all three of them. That will change the entire framework of the investment. And whoever tells them to buy the properties, like I really like when people work with investors like yourself that already know the deal, because if you don't and you're just a real estate agent, you know they mostly doing residential, you're not going to know the person needs to put that money aside or needs to know like, oh, look, there could be six months non-payment. So the more they're in tune to that from the beginning and, you know, it's setting up the whole concept of, you know, what the expectation is. If they're already expecting someone's not going to pay, it's a little easier. But if they're not, then it can really mess up their whole deal. I just want you to know that we don't ever try to take that legal route. We just say that's an attorney question. Yeah. So we don't ever try yeah. No, but try definitely to tell them from an investment yeah. point, you know, when you're doing the numbers, like you said, you're doing it, you, you know, this is how much it's going to cost to fix this one apartment, this and that. You have to take into consideration vacancies, evictions, non-payment. Um, a lot of people buy buildings and they're like, oh, the other landlord said that they were paying. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, credit. Oh, yeah. That's just like the, uh, when you, when you get, um, you know, people on, on Facebook, especially in these groups and they have these, you know, pictures from the seller and I'm like, you're going to trust the seller's uh, pictures on that? Because I've been in that recently. It doesn't look like right. that. Yeah, no, so I, true. I get your point on that. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I like to do when we first get started with the podcast is to actually give you our contact information. So I wanted to switch over to your website. And as we're looking through your website, if you could give us your phone number, um, your physical office address, and then your email address and all that. So the phone number is 860-443-9662, which is also 860-443-YONA, Y-O-N-A. Um, our email address is um, evict, E-V-I-C-T, at yonalaw.com. So anything relative to you know evictions, E-V-I-C-T, at yonalaw.com. And our my office is located in New London, but we're statewide. So. Um, I happen to have an office in New London, but we practice statewide housing. It's all flat free pricing, no matter where it is in the state. So, um, hmm. but not very many people come to my office, of course, these days, we, you know, they're welcome to, but we do a lot of closings and things like that, but we do everything statewide. We always have. So, um, we do have, you know, I have three full-time paralegals that work in the office. And so we're all there during the day, but otherwise we're just virtual nowadays. So that's interesting. It says that you're open. Is that accurate? You have you can make phone calls on Saturday and Sunday and get somebody. On the no. Phone? Okay. <laughs> I don't know why it says that. All right. It's like yeah. web 
website person gone wrong, but no, okay, cool, <laughs> not cool. funny. Okay. I do answer emails all the time, though, 24 hours a day, and most of our stuff comes in through email, um, so that's the best way to communicate with me. Um, one other thing, I want, back to your website, I just wanted to point out that there are, you have a very different type of a website here. So you have, um, I noticed that your eviction video that you have uh, yeah. was on back on the oh first gosh. page there. Yeah. That is really informative and it makes it a really simple to understand process, that eviction process video. Right, and it oversimplifies it and of course things are a little different these days with the right, process. Right, that's true, yeah. But we invented it because we do such a high volume that we ended up explaining to people the process and we were like, oh my God, I can't hear myself say that process again. So if we put it on the, there, we refer people a lot, you know, listen, if you wanna think about the process and what it looks like, you can look at the website. Normally we just tell people also, you know, we're hired to do a job, just don't worry about what needs to be filed when, we'll just do it, um, but a lot of people do want to see you know what happens so that that helps them so you do small claims criminal matters divorce and wills as well I have other attorneys that work for me that do okay. those things like divorce and criminal matters Peter Catania in my office does those and wills and uh, real estate and evictions I do those myself so okay and we do help a lot of small businesses to get started and things like that just anything re related to investors and stuff like that I mean a lot of investors happen to be contractors, so you end up, you know, small claims, contractor, law, that kind of thing. Oh, so you so, handle that type of thing? Yeah. I'm, and we've been helping, I mean, I've been in practice for 16 years, so I've got a lot of people who I've seen them start their business, and you just kind of help them all through uh, what they need to do. Very interesting. Okay. Um, so let's get started, and you can tell us what your experience has been with the evictions process throughout COVID and then maybe um, give us an overview of what the process would be like right now to initiate one. So now, fortunately, we can evict for all reasons. One of the problems during the moratorium was that we couldn't evict for like lapse of time or people call, call them squatters, people who have no rights to occupy. So now that we've picked up and able to do that, we can evict for anything. The non-payment evictions now are a little tricky because we have to have a Unite CT number. So I will say that Unite CT has been paid out hundreds and hundreds if not millions of dollars to my clients to people in the state of connecticut who own property right. it's been fantastic yep. I ref, you know i tell everyone get the unite ct money um because you absolutely want to get that money and a lot of people hesitate because they're afraid if unite ct they're going to have to keep the person longer but even now they're not making you keep them any certain amount of time so you can take the money get paid say through september october the occupant doesn't pay you serve them with a notice to quit again you start the process for non-payment rent. So you can, you're not, in other words, gonna like keep them for so much longer that it doesn't make mathematical sense to take the money. Mm -hmm. They are paying up to $15,000 and a lot of times they're paying that money in, in advance. So your person wow. owes you 8,000, they're gonna pay 15,000. Paying that person's rent you know, in the forward, which is good for you, you're getting your, you know, you know you're getting your money and also good for the tenant because the idea is, you know, look, my rent is being paid for four months. I'm gonna save up so that the fifth month comes, I'm back on my feet, I'm back and able to pay. So it's it's a good program for everyone involved. Um, now that they've loosened up the guidelines, at first they couldn't give the money away because they are <laughs> they made up rules that were so restrictive, no one wanted the money and I don't blame anyone. Um, they were, you know, like, in order to get the money, you had to do too many things. But now that it's been loosened up, the money is flowing more to the landlords. And even though it is, we're still processing a ton of evictions because a lot of times to get the person to actually, the tenant to actually like cooperate and get the money, you have to file an eviction and they're like, okay, well, now I need to really do this application. So what we do is we have to withdraw that eviction once the money goes out to the landlord, but then we can restart it. So, you know, it's, it's good for the courts to know too, like, well, do a withdrawal and we'll write into the court, you know, look, this United CT paid this person's money. So they know why it's being withdrawn. Mm -hmm. So I just uh, acquired some new clients the other day that are investors. Mm -hmm. So, and that's one of the things that they asked me is, you know, what help is there for us? And I said that there are some programs. Mm -hmm. So I tell them to visit Unite CT. You, if you type in Unite CT, the website comes right up and there's a, um, the landlord can initiate the application or the tenant, which is good because sometimes you can't get tenants to actually initiate. So you put in the information as a landlord, you provide them with the tenant's information, they reach out to them and they coordinate getting the application complete. Now, I don't do the applications myself because the landlord does them, but I've seen so many different landlords successfully complete the application, get the money within like 10 days. You know, wow, so, yeah. that's really quick. They're yeah. pushing the applications Holy faster God. now. Their goal is to get the money from approved application 
to 10 days, which is really quick. They deposit it right, immediate deposit into your account. So it's, it's actually a really good thing. That's excellent. So I actually am in this situation exactly right now myself. I bought a four family in February this past year mm -hmm. and um, I inherited the tenants. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I wasn't able to screen the tenants at all. Um, I inherited tenants that basically had no leases. It was mm -hmm. an older person that owned the house before me and they basically didn't do anything with the house at all. And then I, I inherited all this stuff. And mm -hmm. So I have to actually create leases. Yeah. And then I had uh, one tenant that applied to the Unite CT and then I did my portion of the application, but I need a lease in order to complete right. the application. Right. And I don't have a lease, so I actually have to create the lease. Yes, that's that's a struggle. A lot of people don't have leases or mm -hmm. they're not binding anymore. Definitely do a month to month lease on that kind of arrangement. You don't right. want to bind yourself into a year with someone you don't even know how it's going to work out. Right. So I would say, you know, you can put a month to month lease together and Unite CT will accept that. Great. So you just do the month to month, both of you sign it. They'll coordinate getting it signed if you need to. Um, but you, once you get the lease in and everything else, you usually get paid pretty quickly. That's incredible news. Yeah. Finally, some good news for landlords. <laughs> We've been waiting for some good news yeah. for a year and a half. <laughs> I know. And that's why it, it's for me, I'm so happy. I have some landlords who are, you know, really, we're, out, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars from yeah. tenants and things like that, and to see them get the money, um, it makes me really feel good to know, like, okay, at least they're getting reimbursed something. And that's the whole point of these programs. The moratorium wasn't supposed to be in place to punish landlords. It was supposed to be in place to, you know, give these tenants an opportunity to get back on their feet and also compensate the landlord for that time. It just took a little longer to get the compensation out there and. Um, you know, during that time, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of landlords lost their properties and sold their properties and became very discouraged and things like that. So it could have been done in a better way, but again, it was not to punish landlords. It just felt like a punishment. Yeah, I, you just hearing it all over, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, that whole situation, as soon as it started, I was like, oh, this is gonna get really bad. Yeah, I was anticipating a lot more violence. I was surprised that there wasn't a lot more tenant landlord violence. When I first started reading these things, because so much of what happened obviously was so unbelievable. You're reading it, you're like, oh my goodness, my, you know, I just saw that there was gonna be, you know, altercations, physical altercations. Mm -hmm. There have been a lot of them countrywide, but in the state of Connecticut, we didn't have as many as I thought. That's good. Yeah. And you know what? I, I really uh, love the fact that, you know, you are an investor yourself and that you're looking out for the investor. I mean, I just think, you know, that's so rewarding in a way that, you know, you mm -hmm. can. Uh, offer the service mm -hmm. to protect your fellow investors. I mean, right. that, that's just so huge. So I commend you on that as Thank well. Thank you. Yeah, you try, but again, you know, this last year has been hard to really offer a service to help them so much. It's more of just kind of answering questions and things like that and um, trying to give them advice. But it was hard because even, you know, me, the court, we're all answering questions, but we don't have answers. So it has been frustrating to not be able to say, this is what you need to do. So now I'm happy. At least we have Unite CT. We can, you know, do the evictions again. Things are rolling. What kills me, though, is the people that are starting to do the evictions and they, Admittedly, they don't have any money to pay a lawyer, and that's why we keep our fees flat anyway, but they're going and they're doing notice to quits right now, and the, tech, the rules are so technical, and you really need to get someone to do it like that knows it and does it all the time because the governor puts out these orders, and they have to have certain things on them. If you don't have all of the pieces of the puzzle, they just throw it out, right? Well, unfortunately, they won't usually throw it out like right away. They'll let you sit on the docket for three months, and oh. then they'll throw it out. Oh, and then yeah. you have to start all over again. Correct, yeah. And I get Oof. so many calls from people that are like, oh my gosh, my case just got dismissed. I want you to do it. I want you to get them out faster because it's been taking this long. I'm like, no, 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 no. Because you screwed up your case doesn't mean we're going to get them out any faster. You're not going to get you know, a, a fast track because you did it yourself and wasted three months. So it's better to have someone do it right from the beginning. My office or whoever you hire that does do evictions all the time and stays on you know on track with what the governor had put out it's hard because they, he was putting out orders and there's no one who's telling you you need to read this order you could be a lawyer sitting in your office you don't even know this order came out right. so you have to have someone who's constantly looking and figuring it out and if you own property as an LLC you have to have an attorney yeah that's true okay. and, and a lot of people don't like that either a lot of um, LLCs right now the courts have been cracking down to and dismissing cases when it's not been filed by the actual owner I mean even me I've gotten a few cases dismissed because my clients won't tell me Their property is in an LLC or their property is in um, You know a, a trust and believe it or not. I have an intake that um, we we have people fill out and it's it generates all of our forms We do everything kind of like very streamlined because we do such a high volume, but those answers to questions generate forms and we'll ask people, you know, who is the owner of the property? You have to put the right person. 
they fill out the intake and they don't have the right owner on there. A lot of times, some investors don't remember. Hmm. Um, oh, yeah, right. you know, which which LLC did I put this in? Or right, they own 20 properties and right. they can't and, they, and they're like, right. I think it's in my name and they don't think it really matters. And then we've gotten cases in this during this time period dismissed because of it. Okay. And that's nothing worse than that. You feel awful. But you know you have to have your information property. You have to know who owns the property. And we don't do title, title search or anything like that. So it would be up to you, you know, the investor, to tell me who's in the property, who owns it. You know, answer the questions accurately. Otherwise, I can't do my job. And um, that's that's important. Getting the right info. With a, with a trust question, because um, I deal with a lot with the abandoned properties and mm -hmm. neglected properties. Um, and sometimes you can run across, you know, like John Smith Trust. Yes. Um, so that's something that has already started, like a probate. Um, that, am I correct with that? Um, if you have a trust, it doesn't mean that it's already gone through probate. Okay. Someone doesn't have to die in order to trust for own a property. A lot of these um, online like real estate courses, I don't know what they are, but you know, there there's some courses out there that encourage investors to put it into this sort of like a some sort of complicated tax trust. Yep. So you'll get a lot of investors who have it in a trust already, and it has nothing to do with probate. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah, it's just know. like an LLC, but mm -hmm. it's got different features of it that it's got tax, tax yeah. characteristics yeah. Right? and yeah. I, honestly I don't even um, believe in a lot of the reasons why they tell people to do it but they pay for a course and the course will tell them like you need to put it in this weird trust that to I hide the owner better I think right it's, it's, just, a, it's, yeah. a, it's, it's a an umbrella that, yeah. Right. yeah it's an umbrella and I think it's all for other reasons like tax I, I've, I don't even know because I'm not an accountant but I just know that these organizations tell people often to put it into the trust if you get an estate someone's deceased okay. usually it will be the estate of John Smith. That's yes. And that's, then you that's know was, yeah. that's then you know definitely this is an estate that I'm dealing with probate then you know that. So with an estate though they they've already at least started the pro, the probate process it's not necessarily the person has been deceased but they started the family has started it. Right. In okay. order for it to have the title of the estate of the property has to have already, you know, there a will had been filed and a probate yep. file had been done. The problem is a lot of times that they didn't do all the right stuff, so we have to end up like cleaning up the probate in order to sell the property. And that's fine too. It's just a matter of like getting a certificate of no tax and things like that from probate. But if you see as a real estate agent, if you see the estate of, you should ask them what stage are you in a probate? Have you done you know certain things in probate? Because it's better to get it done before you have a buyer who's waiting um, to close. Because okay. you know sometimes you need permission to sell the property and things like that, depending on the probate. All right, thank you. So um, I'm trying to think of some other things that we can go over. I know eviction seems so depressing these days. It's like, <laughs> oh my goodness, like uh, it's like where do you where do you start when people haven't had rent for over a year and things like that? And the process of evictions, I always deter people from trying to learn the process of evictions. It's like you know, it's a bad analogy, but you know, going to a dentist and learning the process of how to get a cavity out really doesn't, you know, matter what the process is. And I deter people from doing it themselves because only because I've seen people waste so much time and money doing that. I used to tell people, you know, over the phone what to write on a notice to quit for free. I'd say, like, I'd rather have you just call me and I'll tell it to you over the phone. But then I would tell them over the phone, then they'd write down the wrong thing. Mm. And then they would <laughs> come back at me and oh, right. say that I told them the wrong thing. So you thing. need to have it in writing. You have I just, it now I'm just like, you know what, just let, let us do the notice to quit. We do everything flat fee anyway, so it's better for me to just do all of the documents. And mm -hmm. I don't want to help someone do it wrong. So the important factor with evictions, I think, is get an attorney to do stuff for you, especially now and get someone who does them, you know, not like your family attorney, get someone who actually practices a lot of eviction law. Right, specializes um, in real estate as person. Yeah, eviction. because they're so technical, and that's that's important. And like you said, if it's an LLC, you're gonna have to hire an attorney anyway. Oh, that was what I was getting at, I was saying the courts have been cracking down on people who file not as an LLC, and mm -hmm. try to, you know, just say, hey, look, no one's gonna know, I'm just gonna put, the, the court looks up now who owns properties on their own, they'll look it up, the clerk mm -hmm. will look it up, and then all of a sudden, you know, your case is being dismissed because they figured it out. So, you so don't want that. What if you have a property management company that handles mm -hmm. um, your evictions for mm -hmm. you, or send, sends out the notices to quit? Are they allowed to do that? Is that a problem? Well, it is a problem because they um, do it wrong all the time, and then <laughs> that's not great. You know, again, they're not lawyers, they shouldn't be drafting legal documents. They do it, um, but all the property managers that work with my office now, which are a lot of them, I have a lot of high volume people, and they always just let us do the notice to quits now. Because like they'll send it over the notice to quit, oh, we just served this, and I'm like, oh my goodness, you know. The problem with sending a notice to quit out that is 
um, not right is that you can't just send another one right away. You have to reinstate the people, wait like another mm -hmm. three weeks. It, it, it's not just a process of like reserving. It, it can really create a delay. And if you don't do it right, your case could be dismissed. I just saw one out of um, this court, as a matter of fact, in uh, Putnam. The, wow. the judge here in Putnam dismissed a case where the attorney's office, this is an attorney, they served a notice to quit. They then served another notice to quit after it for non-payment of rent. And this is like super technical, but if you evict someone for non-payment of rent on a notice to quit, then after that, they don't owe you any rent because now they're, they're been terminated. So you don't have, you don't owe rent technically after you get served a notice to quit. So the person got served with a notice to quit for non-payment and then it turned out that the, something was wrong with the notice to quit. So they reserve another notice to quit for non-payment of rent, but okay. they didn't owe rent and because they had already been terminated by the first notice to quit. So it's so technical and there's lots of case law and it's super dorky of me that I even read this stuff, but the it's interesting because once, so that notice to quit basically made the other notice to quit void. And mm -hmm. the time in which it was between was like maybe four weeks. And then so, they filed it in court. And then it sat there for three months. And wow. this judge here, I could tell she felt bad, but she had to dismiss the case knowing that the second notice to quit was wrong. So, so that, that was a blunder. Mm -hmm. It was residential. Yeah. That was a blunder on the attorney then. Right. And, you know, hey, and, and nothing against them. I mean, we all make yeah. mistakes. This judge is, you know, I've had cases dismissed too. You know, you, you, every office makes mistakes. You make, you know, Scribner's errors and all kinds of things happen. So I'm not saying... You know anything and maybe in the first 10 years of my practice I probably wouldn't have known this technicality but just because I do this all the time and I'm kind of interested in it I know that when you serve a notice to quit and then all of a sudden for whatever reason you decide that notice to quit is not good or um, however it is if it's like I said it's not something wrong with it you can't just reserve another one so then you have to go in and, and send them a letter saying I'm withdrawing this notice to quit like it's like you know we're, we're withdrawing it we're putting you back into the position that you were AKA you now owe rent and then let them not pay the next month. So it can be a real delay when you serve a notice to quit wrong. Um, that's why I tell people don't do that. <laughs> and and sometimes don't, people don't tell me they serve notice to quit. That's a problem too. I don't think it's dorky at all. I mean, we're very passionate in what we do yeah. too and we're constantly talking to other people about real estate and they just really don't care. Like <laughs> calling each other and being like, hey, guess yeah. what? You know, know, this property is available. Right, and like case law, like no one really cares about, you know, how wild it, you know, the technicality of a notice to quit. but. In this field, it's such a small group of lawyers, I guess, that do just you know a lot of housing like like that. I find it interesting because also I want to know too what is the judge going to dismiss on me, and I'll know. Look, if the judge just dismissed this case and I started a case and my client tells me like six weeks into it, oh by the way, I served a notice to quit right before you did. Like they don't tell me that sometimes, and I'm like, oh my goodness. And then if I think, wow, it's going to be a problem because this judge doesn't like that, then I'll have to re redo things. So part of when you ask me, you know, how long does it take? You've got all these variables. Like if something like that happens, okay, that's going to take three months plus the two months of mistake. So, you know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's very tricky. So can you walk us through and make it as simple as possible to understand the process of eviction from the beginning to the end? Yeah, I can do that. So evictions start with a notice to quit, and that's the most important document. You can't amend a notice to quit. So anything you write on there is going to be stuck on there. You can't fix anything. You have to have the right address. You have to have the right people or John or Jane Doe's. You have to have the right reasons on there. They can't be made up reasons. I mean, you could, I've had people come in with all kinds of things they serve themselves, and it's like so fun. Like three pages on a notice to quit. And then, you know, they went out and put the garbage out and they put it in the wrong direction and, you know, they just write everything on there. It has to be, there's like statutory reasons and there's just limited to like seven of them. They wore a red hat, yes, second oh, Tuesday. Yes, and, and you know, I didn't like the way they talked to me and my father went out there, they gave him a dirty look. And I mean, they go on this whole like, you know, and they have every right to want to evict for those reasons, but they have to be encapsulated into the statutory reasons and there's like seven of them so you have to have your reasons on the notice to quit you have to have your right time frame you have to have it served by a marshal in our statutes it says you can have it served by a marshal or an indifferent person but when I, I I tell people there's no one who's really indifferent once you pay someone or if I say to you listen do you mind going and giving this piece of paper to this person like you may be sort of indifferent but now we've been talking so are you really indifferent? Like, what, what if we decide, oh, you know, let's work together in the future? Um, then you're not indifferent. So the, the question of indifference, you don't want your case to be thrown out because you saved $40 on the marshal. 
the marshal, the value of the marshal delivering the $40 paper is that that marshal can come to court too and say, a lot of people will say, I didn't get the notice to quit. Well, the marshal comes in, he's a state marshal. He's gonna say, well, I put it on the door and he's gonna attest to it and he's credible. The indifferent person, first of all, if you didn't, if they're that indifferent, you may not even know where they are because if you really know them and know their phone number, then they're not indifferent. So, and then if, to get them back into court and testify as to where they put it, where they, so I just say, notice to quit should be served by a marshal, even though it doesn't say it has to be. Then the next part of it is a summons and complaint. After the notice to quit, it says on the notice to quit, uh, you've got to vacate at a certain time. Nobody vacates with a notice to quit, just about no one. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of people calling me saying, well, what if they vacate you know, early and then we've paid you all this money, will we get a refund? Like, well, absolutely you would get a refund, but it never happens. <laughs> so you're not getting a refund. But um, after the notice to quit, you serve the summons and complaint. That's what's returned into court and um, starts the case in court. So once the summons and complaint goes out, they have to file their own paperwork with court in a certain amount of time. And again, this goes to the variables of uh, people get caught up and it will say, you know, I'll tell them, look, the return date, which means the date that we've, they've got to file by is the 10th and they'll email me on the 10th. Okay. Today's the day. Can we, can we do the default? I'm like, well, I can do the default, but just so you know, the tenant's going to go in there in seven days and they're going to file their paperwork and the court will 100% accept it. They're not going to ever say to someone, unless judgment's already entered, no, you, you know, we, we're not taking your paperwork. So the dates are fluid in evictions and each court is different. So, you know, you can't hold anyone to like a date. That's why we always tell people on or about such and such, we can do this. We do everything when we can, but the courts like have so much leeway. So the next thing that happens after you file it is you wait for the tenant to do a response and then you file, you know, in turn. And the goal is to get a court date. The first court date is always a mediation. And that's where the parties just kind of like try to resolve it and enter in a stipulated agreement. And that's usually the best way to go, but it depends. Things are so different now where everything is going in front of a judge quicker that you're not always better taking the agreement. Sometimes you're better off just going in front of the judge and doing your trial. So how long from the time they stop paying rent? Can you, or at what point, how many days into, the how, how many days late? Well, be? in Connecticut, we have a 10 day grace period, That's so you can serve them on the 11th. Okay. Um, and you have to be careful too with that because if you have a month to month lease and you want to evict someone for the prior month, you really can't do that. You have to wait and do it within the month of the non-payment. Oh. So if you, and that's technical too, a lot of people don't know that. Hmm. So with a year lease, you can go backwards, but with a month to month, you really can't. So within the month that they don't pay you, the 10th comes, then you can serve them on the 11th. Um, and then, you know, once you serve them, you can collect rent afterwards, but it's called use and occupancy. So you have to have language on the notice to quit that allows you to collect the money afterwards. And now, because of the governor's special orders, we can't do that. When you serve a notice to quit right now for non-payment, there's no such thing as take the use and occupancy and proceed. Once they pay, it's rent. And now that they paid you rent, you can't proceed. You have to start a new one. So that's going on right now. Hmm. That's it's, just a common theme. I mean, as you said that, you know, with the extra $40 that you're gonna, you know, you think you're gonna save. Um, very common theme in the property manager we had last time, last week. Uh, you know, don't, don't skimp out and try mm -hmm. to, you know, save money on something. Uh, let the professionals handle it. Uh, my question basically is, how do you feel that you are um, different from other eviction attorneys or what do you think sets you apart oh, from I don't know. other I, mean, I, I like I said I mean I, and I'm not one to ever say if someone calls me and says you know look or have an attorney we want to get rid of them and hire you I'm like no, no no go back to your attorney because probably they're doing just fine for you and I'll look up the case and I'll send them back we don't really I, I think it's all a matter of who you feel comfortable with I mean we have a streamlined process that is some people like it, you know, you put everything in, you're gonna get automated notice, notices, which means we get them as well. So we know the day of, the day we can serve your summons. We have no paper files that we're ruffling through files and saying like, what can we file today? We have everything automated, so it tells us what we need to do on any given time. But no system is perfect and you know, we've made mistakes and you know, some people like our system. We get people who don't like our system. So you just have to work with someone who you feel comfortable. I will say the flat fee, definitely find someone who does a flat fee. You do not want to be billed hourly for an eviction. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be billed hourly for an eviction where someone's typing up a notice to quit and they don't do it all the time. Because that would be like, you know, me typing up a divorce 
decree. I don't do that. So you want a, someone who's not reinventing the wheel type of a thing. You want um, them to be efficient at it so they just ban Evictions are really, I mean, and not, not to degrade myself, but it's not rocket science evictions. I mean, they're technical, but you don't want someone like reading case law necessarily in order to draft your paperwork hourly. Right. Um, you want it to be like someone who's efficient. We do a high volume. And you know, at that high volume, you do you, says, you could have errors and things like that. But we do not bill people to like invent things and things like that. So efficiency with evictions is everything. Because when if you if you have a lawyer who doesn't have a process, then there your notice to quit you know ends on the tenth, and on the eleventh, your summons and complaint can go out and be served. Well, we serve it closest to the 11th as we can, as we can, because our systems are automated, so we'll get a notification to do it. But a paper file is just sitting there, oh my gosh, it was on the bottom of my desk, I didn't, you know, when we get to it, mm -hmm. oh, I don't know, you know, if they don't have a calendar, like it's calendaring, a lot of this stuff is calendaring mm -hmm. to make it efficient. It's, again, it's not thinking necessarily, it's thinking how can I process these in a way that's efficient for my office to keep my fee low, right. and then efficient for the client to get their information, and also efficient to make sure that all of the stuff is not Scribner's errors. So that's why we do our forms the way we do, because anything that you put in an initial notice to quit in my office, it's not gonna come up the third thing typed wrong, because it all generates the forms. Mm -hmm. So if it's right, that's great. If it's not right, <laughs> you know, that information you provided. So that's how we just reduce it's all about reducing mistakes and reducing wasting time. So if you, if I know I do everything on the day that I can, I'm pulling that time in that the landlord's losing money because every day that I don't do it is money out the door. And the same thing as if you know I file a mistaken document and that wastes three weeks, you know that's painful too. Not to say again, not to say it doesn't happen, but you can only control so many things, and that's what we try to do in our office. Hmm. Uh, so you started out. Uh, mm -hmm. Say it's the first of the month. The tenant doesn't pay their rent. Um, the rent's due on the first of the month. At day 11, you file the notice to quit, or you have the sheriff, uh, marshal. Right, you have the marshal file the notice. Well, you, you draft the notice to quit, your lawyer or whoever does it, mm -hmm. and then your marshal takes it out, delivers it on the 11th. Mm -hmm. On the 12th, you can then serve the summons and complaint. Okay. And that summons and complaint has to be dated the 12th. If you date it the 11th, your case gets dismissed. Wow. We've been down that road too. <laughs> wow. So having, having that I've done this for 15 years, I pretty much have done every mistake like myself. Right. Once you get that happens to you once, you never let that happen right. again. Yeah. Because you know, in my practice, I was like, okay, we're gonna do this early. We're gonna type up the complaints early. Mm -hmm. And then they end up dated before the notice to quit is over and right. that'll dismiss your entire case. Yeah. So that's another technicality too. But yeah, you wanna serve everything like as much as you can close to it. So um, after the summons and complaint, then you have your court date? Oh uh, yeah, then you get your first court date, which is a mediation, and then um, you know if you can't resolve it at the mediation, you'll en end up in front of a judge on a trial. And during the- How long until that happens? Well, each, again, each court is different. So yeah. New London, Norwich, and Putnam actually move pretty quickly, mm -hmm. um, and Danielson, but other courts, it's different, you know? So it just depends. Um, could be a couple weeks, so you have a mediation. Maybe two or three weeks later, you'll have a trial. Hmm? Waterbury is taking a lot longer, so there would be four weeks later. So if you're in mediation and the person says, I want three weeks, and you're like, some people just, no, dig my heel heels in, I'm not giving you three weeks, we're going to trial. Well, that's why you need a lawyer to say to you, well, guess what, you're not gonna get a trial within three weeks. You're, it's gonna be four weeks till you get a trial, and the judge is then gonna give them 30 days. Hmm. So you may want to take the agreement. So you have to have someone who knows that too. The mediator will usually help, but they're paid to be in the middle, um, even though a lot of times mediators are more towards the tenant, um, as are all of our courts pretty much. So you know you have to know like what's smarter um, to take and more yeah, practical. Yeah, the best option. Is. Yeah, yeah. It's not always what you think it is either. And a lot of times you know you're mad by the time you go to court. And I'll say this as. I'm, you know, being as I have my own units, I do very few evictions on my own properties. But when I do, I'm like the, my worst client. I'm, I'm like irate, you know, I lose my mind over it. And I like, you know, I'm the, I, because it's when it's yourself, you're so emotional. And I yeah. even see it with myself when I do this for a business and I go to court with someone who doesn't pay me, I just start like freaking out and I can't make an agreement. I can't. I don't do a good job like you know for myself I'm a bad client and I'm a bad lawyer for myself because I'm so emotional into it mm -hmm. because truthfully when someone doesn't pay you rent they're stealing from you like they're literally stealing yeah. money out of your pocket you're not going to get it back it's no different than me walking over to you right now taking your wallet and running my intention is to not give you your money back I'm stealing so when you have that happen to you you're so emotional 
and I still feel like that, you know, I'm so emotional. So I, so it's harder for me when I'm doing my own. But that said, that's another reason why it's always good to have a lawyer. Someone who's separate from you who can just like resolve it. That's kind of my skill set. That's actually, I like that you it. said that because I feel like throughout this whole process mm-hmm. of COVID and um, the eviction, the moratorium on evictions, I feel like people have, are looking at it like it's a free ride that right. they can just take this opportunity to not pay rent. Right. But you're so right. I mean, they're literally stealing money from the landlords. And I think people don't mm-hmm. recognize that enough. Un- mm-hmm. Until you're a landlord and you're not getting paid every month when you should be and you're missing mm-hmm. out on thousands of dollars right. every month. And you can't pay your mortgage. You yeah. can't pay your insurance. And as, as much as I said about Unite CT being a good organization, a good thing, the bad part of Unite CT is this. If you are as a landlord, you don't want to keep your, your tenant they won't give you the money, which to me is so counterintuitive. It's like, wait a minute, you're not gonna give me the money that you've been given to give to landlords because you're gonna give this person $15,000 to go to another landlord and give that new person the $15,000. But I've had them living here and I'm owed 8,000, but you won't give me the money. They will not give you your money unless you're gonna keep them. Also, a lot of tenants now will say, I'm not gonna do the program. I don't want this guy to get a dollar of this money, even though they've lived there for free for a year. Mm. And, and so this makes no sense, but it is true that that does happen. And it's, it's, it's really not right. The organization, I believe United CT should be here to pay a landlord, regardless of whether um, the person's going to pay or not, because it's owed to them. The money is already owed to them. And it's, if they're here to make, you know, people whole, then that's what they should do. Mm-hmm. In the beginning of this whole, you know, the COVID madness, uh, I said that even, you know, landlords from uh, banks that were saying that we're going to push it. And I'm, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to tell people, it's like they're not gonna take, you know, like they're not gonna let you stop paying mortgage, rent, mm-hmm. and any other thing. They're gonna just tack it on the end. And a lot of people just didn't realize, right. you know, they, they just mm-hmm. thought like, oh, I don't, I, I can stop paying, yeah. you know. And I'm like, no, it's not like that. Being in forbearance is different than not having, a, mm-hmm. than having a moratorium. I mean, the truth is, you know, everyone said, you you don't have to pay. You're not being evicted. You still owe the rent. But we all know as investors, you know, owing the rent and actually ever having to pay it back are two very different things. Absolutely. And nobody is really enforcing judgments to pay people back even before this. So all that money is pretty much walking out the door when you don't keep them, when you don't take the Unite CT money. So um, it, the, the eviction protection program, I think, is just too heavy on the tenants and preventing mm-hmm. evictions and all of that and homelessness versus the landlords preventing foreclosure because if you're not paying the landlord the money that they're owed eventually they're going to be foreclosed upon and if they live in a duplex and they're on one side the bank is then going to owe their duplex and they'll be for evicted so it's a cycle and you can't stop it unless you help both sides exactly you know? complicated so this so is why depressing. you hire an attorney <laughs> <laughs> I know. so you call me and get depressed it's like i said like everyone calls me now i'm like oh my goodness it's like you know oh gosh i'm calling you because i think i might have an eviction I'm like okay let's just get this straight i'm going to say nothing that is good news <laughs> like everything i say in the past year and a half has been like absurd you know for me to say to you well uh, actually we can't do evictions at all right now and it's the courts are closed for six months i mean it's absurd it's so um you know disrespectful to landlords and property rights and really the Constitution of the United States, which bores everyone, but the truth is like whatever happens to property rights, they, they're not, you know, and it's hard to explain to regular people that we live in this country and now the government has said that basically you don't even own your property rights because you can have someone live there for a year. Mm, so you're yeah. explaining that to people. I'm like, oh my gosh, well, I'm in the wrong field here because I'm saying so many things that are just upsetting and, you know, but, I'm ho- but now that it's coming and now things are moving faster in court, the Unite CT program is fantastic for you know people to get a lot of money mm-hmm. out of it. I've heard that it's very, um, you know, it's very easy to get the applications through. There's not a lot of checking. It did seem like an easy process. I did have the the one complication where I didn't have a lease. The lease, right? Yeah. yeah. So I have to finish that part of it, mm-hmm. and I think that's the last part of it, yeah. and then I'll be. Approved. And you you probably already put your information in for I your did. bank account, and they'll just put the money in. I've had clients who don't want the Unite CT money. Purposely, they'll have to go through the application process, but they don't want it. And then Unite CT just puts the money in, and they're like, oh my god, what do I do? I want to you know, get rid of it. So they'll just automatically put it into your account. So they actually put it in the landlord's account? Correct, yeah. Well, that's good, because yeah. I have heard, I thought there, were an, uh, there was another program, but they actually give it to the tenant. 
There was programs throughout this. There was like a T-Rat program that mm -hmm. was giving up to $4,000. They were giving it to the tenant, but then uh, the, the landlord, but then if the tenant said they wanted to go elsewhere, they were like literally handing it to them to go and um, you know pay another landlord in theory. Um, but I, I don't think any of the programs are doing that now. They are giving it to the tenant to go and secure another place, but they're giving it to the other landlord, my understanding, which makes uh, you know makes sense. Yeah. But. One other concern that I had about um, the Unite CT program was somebody brought this up to me and I said, I hadn't even thought of that before because um, there's there are so many different programs that are out there for, for landlords and, and different scenarios. One of them is um, you can get rehab money for your property as long as the tenants qualify for it. and um, But the, pr the property actually has to meet certain criteria to mm -hmm. meet the codes for Section 8 mm -hmm. housing. So then somebody said to me, well, in order to get the Unite CT property, uh, Unite CT money, does your property have to meet those codes? And I said, I don't know. No. That's, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. It's it's just for COVID because of the moratorium, right? Right. Unite CT so is Unite CT is just is is just the federal money that came from you know federal money that was distributed to each state. So Unite CT is the organization in Connecticut that's distributing the federal money that was granted to them. Right. Okay. It has nothing to do with anything regular as far as um you know, any sort of sources uh, for, for regular preventions of evictions. Those are usually smaller organizations like, you know, charities and local places that do mm -hmm. that. So their criteria is totally different. But my understanding is most of the organizations don't have inspections. Um, you know, if the people are already living in the property, they're not going to say, I'm not going to pay your back rent because you don't have a dishwasher or something like right. that. Right, yeah. So it's usually unrelated to Section 8. And most apartments, um, Section 8 qualifications are different than regular uh, qualifications, the inspections are different. I've never heard of a private uh, of a Section Eight criteria to be applied to like a non-Section Eight property. Okay, yeah, I just didn't know the answer to that. I thought it was a pretty good question because yeah. I hadn't even thought of that before. Yeah, they're not going out and doing inspections. They're basically just like <laughs> you know, they're they're and they're barely able to process. I think what's coming through there's right. such a high volume. Yeah. I started this in the numbers like the the Unite CT number that you need was like you know three thousand five hundred. Now it's like 100,200. They've been going in order because I do them every day. I see that like, oh, wow. okay, now we're at the 20,000s, we're at the 30. That's the number of people that are applying. So there's a lot of applications being processed and to their you know, credit, they are doing a decent job of, of kind of getting through them, I think, with the help of legal aid and stuff like that. But um, Excellent. you know, that is good. Like I said, more money, the better. I've had clients who are property managers and they're like, we've gotten you know, over $300,000 for our clients. Property managers I really respect that are like really powering through for their client. These applications, getting their clients the money is a really good thing to do as a property manager. So you said that you have property managers that work for your company or they work with your company? Oh yeah, no, I don't have anyone who works for me. I do oh, okay. my, but I mean just my clients who, you know, are property managers mm -hmm. that bring all of their evictions to our office. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, okay. We just work with so many that we see you a lot of different, with the yeah, we work with, with the property managers a lot of times we don't really meet or know the owner. Um, so I know a lot of property managers well and they all operate differently, but ones that do a really good job have been pushing through these United CT applications um, and, you know, getting their clients the money, um, which is really a good thing to do. I, I, I totally agree with being proactive, mm -hmm. especially as a property manager. I mean, I think that's, you know, the best thing that they can do is, you know, be that proactive uh, person for all their mm -hmm. tenants. Yeah, so. because if you're a landlord and you're out of state in California, you've hired someone to do your property management, mm -hmm. you know, putting in an application to get the rent is not the same as collecting the rent from the person, but you've been in, you know, tasked with getting this person's money. Now it's just a different source and you might have to go through some, you know, links and things like that are aggra aggravating, but getting them the money is definitely doing mm -hmm. a great job for them and doing your diligence as a property manager. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like it's some good news for landlords for the first time in quite a while. I actually just, yeah. I mean, I heard about the United CT program probably about maybe a month and a half or two months ago, mm -hmm. I think, was the first time I heard of it. Yeah. And we have um, one of the guys from our office owns 16 units, and his name is Dennis Gold, and he applied for it, and he got some money out of the program. Right. And funny. I just recently, about maybe two weeks ago, I think, was the when we applied for it for one of my tenants. I have three that are actually behind. Oh, and you should put the applications in because they are looking for money you know to give out right now and even if the person's one month behind i actually heard someone say to me the other day that even if they're not behind but they anticipate becoming behind you can put an application in and they'll pay like three or four months in advance wow yeah 
So if you have a tenant who you know is struggling for whatever reason, tell them, look, apply for the program. Because if their income goes below a th certain threshold, mm -hmm. they can qualify for rent forward. And that's only going to help you as a landlord because, hey, wow. look, if they have four months paid, they're more likely to pay that fifth month. And, you, you know, at least you have four months, you know that's paid. It's certain. That's the so. best news I think I've heard for landlords in a year and a half. Yeah, no, and, and there's still a lot of money left. I know that a lot of people read the news and you see, you know, look, they've only given away 20% of the money that's out there to assist mm -hmm. people. And that is scary to a certain degree because you're like, oh my goodness, why can't I not give this money away? Um, but, you know, there's a lot more money out there. So definitely people should be getting that money. Well, um, before we go, let me just see if I can wake up my laptop over here again and get your screen back up over here. And we can give your contact information again. Uh, so... Want to just get started with your contact sure. information? Sure. Uh, it's again, it's Yona Law. So you'd want to uh, send me an email at evict e v i c t at y o n a l a w dot com, and you can also call us at eight six zero four four three nine six six two. We're there pretty much like every day, except for like you said, Saturday and Sunday we're not there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Only our I website that says we're there. But... Yeah, that's not true. <laughs> Damn it, Google. <laughs> it's a great website you have there. It's a really nice looking website, and you have your prices that are nice and nice and easy to find right there. So yeah. I love the flat fee thing because I think that people that are especially not familiar with this process, mm -hmm. they have no idea how much the fees are going to be. And when an attorney tells them it's going to be hourly, they're like, I have yeah. no idea how much it's going to cost me. So it's so nice to have that flat fee. I think that's I, a great I idea. I will say though, during this whole thing, I never in my process ever limited my, my flat fee. But this year, because of the number of phone calls, we have now made our flat fee have you know a caveat of like up to 15 phone calls during your case because mm -hmm. we had people who were calling us every day. And I know it's a stressful time, but I can't process you know, mm -hmm. if, we're, if we're getting a call from a client every single day with, you know, so now we have that in there as a little bit of a deterrent to kind of like, you know, have the calls be less. But our system is set up that you shouldn't have to call us because you're getting updated, you know, information. But it's been such a difficult time and we really want to help people, but you can't talk to people every day, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised lenders don't do that with, uh, is the appraisal on yet? Is it appraisal on yet? Oh, is it appraisal on yet? Yeah. After uh, 10 calls, you start. <laughs> I know, exactly. That's They're the same thing. You're pushing, and I get it. They want things to happen, but um, you know that's what we we have done. That Although we haven't charged anyone yet, we say we can. <laughs> it's just knowing that it's there makes me feel better. Like, okay, I can control this a little bit. Right. You probably just get people calling me every day to see what, what's the latest news today, oh, you know? And, and, and the worst <laughs> is when, you know, the like a husband and a wife will call, you know, hire us, and the husband calls in the morning, the wife calls in the afternoon to ask the same questions. We're like, no, 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 we're flat fee, but this is, you know, you need to help us to keep the flat fee low by not making us do two, the same thing twice. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, that's just a, a little pet peeve, so everyone can take that away. But most <laughs> important positive news from this is Unite CT money. Right. Definitely. Yeah, that's excellent news. So yeah. I'm really happy to hear that. And I'm happy to finally have you on the podcast. This is great. Yeah, thanks for um, having me. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. I'd like to have you back on maybe in six months or a year, whenever you're comfortable to come back over. And or maybe at that point, we'll have such a fluid process in this that we'll be able to bring it to you and show your office off a little bit. Well, these lights, you have to bring the lights. <laughs> Anyone who's watching just has to know that there's so many lights that make us all look great. It's fantastic. Can, I'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, um, we're just going to wrap it up right now. So thank you so much for everybody uh, for watching the episode of the podcast with Yona Gregory. I'm Anthony Shabbat from Shabbat and Associates Real Estate Group of EXP. Attorney Yona Gregory, Law Office of Yona Gregory. And Jay Lorette of Lorette Investment Group. And thanks again for watching, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Have a great day. Thank you.